Welcome back to Oregon to the Arctic. Today, we are beginning episode 3 by, somewhat reluctantly, leaving behind the beautiful Kenai Peninsula. Our first stop heading back north was the Alaska Wildlife Conservation Center. This is a great opportunity to get to make sure that you see at least most of the animals on your Alaskan list. This is a refuge for sick, wounded, and orphaned animals, and they get to live their lives in a stunning setting at the end of the Turnigan Arm near Portage. The main destination for the day was Eagle River, just about 10 miles north of Anchorage proper. There, we had rented a small public use cabin in the Eagle River campground, which is a part of Chugach State Park. We spent a total of two days here, experiencing various parts of the city. Well guys, it is Friday morning here in Eagle River. So, enjoying the, the cabin life. Um, today's our first, well, and only full day um, here in the Anchorage area. So, we've got some kind of maintenance items planned. Um, we're gonna do some laundry, get things cleaned up before we hit the road. Um, we're gonna hit the Alaska Native Heritage Center today and then see what else we've got. Um, yesterday, we basically just got checked into the cabin here um, had a nice lunch and then had a great dinner at Matanuska Brewing. So it was a good, good food day. We're both very full, uncomfortably full, but the cabin's a blast. Having a little fire is nice inside. So um, got some things. Got to spend some time uh, checking out on the rig. To <coughs> excuse me, on the rig today. Got some new noises and everything after the really rough roads into Dawson. Um, so I'm gonna spend some time on the truck and see what's up there also So should be a good day and Anything of interest will take you along for the ride If you're going to be in Anchorage do make time to visit the Alaska Native Heritage Center It is well worth a visit to learn more about the indigenous tribes of Alaska and what they have gone through and have had to endure. Taking the tour of the six different village types from each tribe was very interesting and made even better by our guide that interspersed facts with a fantastic dry sense of humor and deadpan delivery. Maybe this long because when they're cutting up whales, they have a chance of exploding. What they'd use these for is that if they didn't have enough wood to make the frame of the house, they'd use these instead. If a whaling captain passed away, they'd use one of these as a gravestone. Today we use these as places for tourists to take pictures. So here is the traditional entrance and then enter backwards because they'd be wearing the regalia and on the back of it would be their clan symbol and show that they're a part of the clan. If someone were to enter forward back then, they'd be seen as an intruder and they'd get hit in the head. <laughs> well, you don't have to worry about that today. Our time at the cabin also gave me a chance to do some evaluation on the Yukon's tires. On the way south out of Canada, I had noticed that the front pair were both wearing on the inside edges the left worse than the right. I mostly blame the Klondike Highway heading into Dawson City for this. There were two or three impacts here that made me question if the wheels had been knocked completely off the truck. The second part of the blame lies with myself for forgetting to install my Dirt King locking alignment cams in all the preparation leading up to the trip. On inspection, I found nothing loose or damaged and decided to rotate the left side tires and spread out the wear and continue to monitor the right front for now. After two days of some urban exploration and extremely good eating, visit 49th State Brewing if you get the chance. We were once again heading north. The plan was to make the short side trip to Takitna with the slim hope of seeing Denali outside of the clouds. It's said that only 30% of visitors get to see the mountain when it's out, and we were in the lucky few, getting to see the entire 
20,310 feet of this magnificent mountain. While we have had and will have more moments of rain on this visit, the weather has definitely smiled down on us when it counted most. With a breakfast of waffle pops, yes, waffle pops in our bellies, and making a stop at the Talkeetna Historical Society Museum, we got out of town just as the tour buses were getting in, unloading the great cruise ship masses. That is an experience I can do without. Backtracking to the Parks Highway brought us to Cantwell for fuel in the beginning of the 135 mile long Denali Highway. We were looking at putting in about 50 miles today and then peeling off the main road to find camp. During this trip, I have often found myself incapable of describing what it's really like to be here in any meaningful way. The Denali Highway highlights that to full effect. There really aren't words to describe the feelings and the videos, even if made in more capable hands than mine, just can't do it justice. The vast expanses of green, broken up by shimmering lakes and streams, the natural wide spacing of the low trees of the boreal forest with giant mountains lining their horizon. This is what wilderness should feel like and if we get a say in our own afterlife, this is my heaven. As much as I love the untouched portions of the landscape, I have to say that I am grateful that various human activities have left us access ways into this landscape. Valdez Creek Road is one of those access ways. One of the larger offshoots on the Denali, it takes you far off the relatively more beaten path. My goal on the map was a lake at the very end of the road. Later in my research, I put it together that this was the same lake that is in Lifestyle Overland's Alaska series, Roosevelt Lake. As the Eagles once sang, there is no more new frontier. And so we go, as we have before here, on the shoulders of giants. And in various places of this little road, actual shoulders of actual giants could have come in handy, as it becomes more creek than road, and I'm sure traveling just a little earlier in the season of what has been a very wet year would have made a couple of these areas beyond my comfort level. The water became a fun version of choose your own adventure, making our way through the creek and its vegetation, occasionally stopping to actually check the water depth before crossing. When we reached the last approach down to the lake, the trail was narrow and deeply rutted with standing water. Now, reviewing the footage, it actually doesn't look all that bad now, but in the moment, I made the disappointingly responsible decision not to go any further, worried that we would be able to get down and end up not being able to get back up the sloppy incline with our heavy truck. When rolling solo, play it safe. So instead, we explored a couple tracks that went above the lake and found a nice little spot with a great view. As we got out to set up camp, Nicole eventually noted that were some bear prints and then a lot of bear prints interspersed with a lot of moose prints. 
It seemed our little spot was quite the large animal highway. Man, there are a lot of bear tracks up here. Um, big bear tracks and some pretty darn good sized moose too. Um, and with how much vegetation there is, you just can't see anything. So being Alaska newbies, we're a little, a little paranoid um, about potential bear situation. There's just, there were so many up here. Um, and they could be laying on the other side of some brush and you'd never even know it. So we're gonna head back down the trail. Um, just getting up here to see that Roosevelt Lake is, is a win in and of itself. So we're, we're gonna be happy with that. Uh, play it safe since we're alone and uh, head back down. So we'll take you along. We'll show you where we end up. All right, guys, so this is where we've ended up for the night. We've got those epic peaks in the background there. And then on the other side, we've got the snowy mountains and a giant glacier over there you can see. Tons of mosquitoes. And then over here, we've got the, uh, it's just sitting in the river valley. So not a bad spot, nice and open, good visibility. So shouldn't have a, shouldn't have bear issues. And so for dinner, uh, we're just gonna do sandwiches so we don't have to cook, make any smells that we don't need to. So that's the plan. We'll see you soon. Getting further north and the sun finally set behind the surrounding 9,000 foot peaks at right around midnight. And it wasn't long before morning arrived and we were off to see the eastern half of the Denali Highway. We're soon traveling on an esker, which is a sinuous ridge of silt, sand, and gravel that were carried and deposited by a stream that flowed within a glacier, and it was confined by the walls of ice. When that glacier melted away, these deposits are left behind as elongated mounds. Eskers along this highway are some of North America's most outstanding examples of this type of glacial feature. Things fairly quickly transitioned to a more open tundra-like landscape, though still with stunning glacier-covered peaks on the horizons. As you get nearer to the west end, you'll get to cross McLaren Pass, which is the second highest road pass in the state at 4,086 feet. The official sign, which we didn't even get footage of, is hilariously at a much lower point on the road than the actual high point, and we passed it before even thinking that it should be there. But the sign has a great viewpoint, so I guess that's what counted when placing it. The Tangle Lakes Archaeological District comprises a large portion of the east end of the highway. This district has some of the densest concentrations of archaeological resources in the North American subarctic. More than 500 archaeological sites indicate that ancient peoples have inhabited this area for at least 10,000 years. We had a ways to go up the Richardson Highway towards my planned camp area of Rainbow Basin. The road that we would be taking goes up behind Rainbow Ridge, which is a prominent feature on the highway and runs all the way up alongside the Canwell Glacier, although we were gonna turn off more into the basin area for camp. Since it was still fairly early in the day, we went up the Richardson Highway another four miles or so to a trail alongside Kastner Creek. Not that long ago, there was an ice arch and cave at the end of the Kastner Glacier. I 
I had read the entrance collapsed last summer and we wanted to make the hike to see where things stand this year. We had a blast on the trail as it pretty much disappears for a while, looking at all the different kinds of rocks that the glaciers moved and forced down from the mountains. There is an amazing variety here, and it was hard to keep Nicole from taking them all back to the truck. We eventually reached the toe of the glacier, and on your right is a rectangular vertical wall that is now separated from the rest of the glacier. On the left is the glacier proper that was once connected to the other side. Rockfall is a constant concern as they slip and fall from the vegetation oh, covered that was, that was kind of a big one. <laughs> it's a humbling thing to stand beside something this old and to get to share an extremely brief part of its extremely long but rapidly ending life. Trip reports from this year say the cave is still accessible, but with the amount of water, we didn't even attempt to go around to the other side. With a truly special experience under our belts, we made the hike out, and it was time to head to the Red Rock Canyon Trail to see Rainbow Basin. This is an area more often frequented by ATVs than full-size trucks, but it is entirely doable. After a ways on the trail, the road splits, with one section continuing to run up on the moraine alongside the Canwall Glacier, and the other rounding the side of Rainbow Ridge and taking back into the basin. There is a small lake back there that I was wanting to try to get to, and we ended up passing right by where we could have turned, because once again it seemed more like a creek than a trail. It actually took a little while to realize this, but it was a great drive nonetheless. On the way back down, we elected to forgo attempting the water crossings and went back to a beautiful large open spot to make camp. After dinner and a good night's nice rest, an easy morning with a beautiful sunrise and our bellies full of elk bacon. We hit the trail to make our way to Fairbanks for fuel and a Walmart resupply, 
and then on to the Dalton Highway. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. We take on the legendary Hall Road to cross the Arctic Circle, traverse Attigan Pass over the stunning Brooks Range, and finally reach the Arctic Ocean in the waters of Prudhoe Bay. As always, thank you for watching, and we will see you again for the last episode.